Um, good morning, everybody. Um, can I have a show of hands of, of who's heard of QAA before? Wow, that's a lot of you. And who knows exactly what we do? Okay, so <laughs> slightly less of you. I'll let, let you into a secret. I'd heard of the acronym, but I didn't really know what QAA did before I started working there. And I've you know, been at the University of Bath a long time. Um, so it's been a real learning experience for me as well. Um, so I will tell you what we do. Okay, and this is our mission, and I think, I think it's a good one. It's about safeguarding standards and improving quality uh, for UK higher education. And I think um, quality, I mean, it's at the heart of higher education, and it, and it kind of perforates every area. So in some senses, this is really key for, for all of us. Um, so what do we do? Um, well, the main stuff that we do is around higher education review, and I was really heartened to see this pull-up here, which is actually from Liverpool John Moores, which is about their recent QAA review that they had, when they did exceptionally well and got two commendations. I think one was, um, they got lots of um, good practice highlighted, and one of the areas was around uh, Web Hub and their analytics work. So, you know, they're a shining example of the type of um, institution we work with. Um, but those of you who know a little bit more about this area will know that cyclical review or sort of visiting institutions every couple of years is actually something that's changing and um, it's going to be, there's going to be much more sort of risk-based um, review and, and looking at um, providers in a slightly different way. Um, something else we do is we have the UK Quality Code for Higher Education. This is a, a huge big document which kind of says how you can be a great university um, and, and that's, um, there's some really interesting stuff in that and that's been written in sort of um, collaboration with the sector but some, some good points in there. Um, we investigate concerns, which is an interesting area. So people coming up with problems, um, they have to be systemic and related to academic standards. So it's not just a case of, you know, my, my lecturer um, has done X, Y, and Z to me on a personal basis, but it's much more sort of something that goes through the, the um, institution. Um, we involve students in our work. Um, there's a lot of student engagement that goes on at QAA. We have student reviewers um, that come along to the reviews. We have student panels. They're involved in lots of different ways. We have a lot of collaboration with the NSS, um, uh, the sorry, NUS, and all sorts of other um, work with students. Um, we work internationally, so we go and review um, higher education provision in other countries for those countries, and also UK provision in those countries as well. That's a really expanding area. Um, we assign degree awarding powers um, at the moment, and that, that's a, a whole another interesting area. And we also do a lot of work around access to higher education, which is a, a really exciting um, field, looking at widening participation, getting people into institutions that no, wouldn't normally go, go away and study in that way. Um, we're not a regulatory body. I think it's important to say that at this current moment in time, though things may change in the future. Um, so you know, just watch this space. And something else I haven't actually put up there that we're involved is, in, is with the TEF as well, which is something that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, and a lot of that is kind of interesting data work, and I can talk to people about that later. Okay, um, students as consumers. I had a really good discussion yesterday with some people on Twitter about the, the use of the word consumers and the kind of terminology that we're using now in HE. Um, I think this term came up as part of the Brown Report um, and then came through through the government's white paper at students at the heart um, of the system. It's this idea very much about um, that, that not just that they're consuming, but they're almost as sort of uh, in some ways um, that they're buying some sort of contract or they're having some sort of transaction going on there. Um, you may have differing opinions on how this works. You may have different thoughts on whether higher education is a suitable space to talk about business, but this is the way things are going. Um, if we look at the landscape, um, you know, we all know that students are paying their course fees now um, with an average debt of around 45000 a year. Um, quite scary stuff. I have three children. I'm not looking forward to the kind of debt that they're going to they're gonna get in the end. Um, fees up to about 9000 but some alternative providers and private u universities charging more there. Um, we're, we're along with this, this brings clear expectations from the students. You know, they expect a lot more. They bang for their buck. They want something for that. Um, there's also sort of the, the landscape changing in that the different providers have different offerings now. It's much bigger, broader landscape. And people who've read the recent white paper that's come out will know about this kind of idea of marketization and, and just that, you know, the government wants to allow different types of universities into the sector in a, in a sort of quicker way. Um, so lots of challenges there, I think. Um, we deal with um, 
further education colleges that um, deliver HE and also alternative providers, this, uh, sort of people outside of the sector in some senses. I mean, it's, it's very different. If you're going to go to Oxford or Cambridge, you're going to have a certain expectation compa compared to if you go to somewhere like the London School of Business or something. It's a, it's a really changing area. Um, complaints are on the rise. I've got some stats here from the OIA, the Office for Independent Adjudicator. 2005, 542 complaints. Um, going up to two, um, 2013, 1,972 complaints, 2014, 2040 complaints. Students are complaining a lot more about stuff. They're just, they're, they're fed up. They're paying money. They're going to complain if things don't work out the way they want them to. Um, so this is, you know, it's, this is a different environment for some of us. Um, it's a big investment. It's a huge investment. You know, it's, it's like buying a very, very expensive car. It's a significant amount of time and money. Um, the decision ha needs to be properly informed and it needs to be right for them. Um, the Office for Fair Trading in 2014, they did a sort of call for information um, to get a better understanding of what was happening in the sector with regard to these kind of changes. And they found three areas that they were slightly concerned with. These areas around information available to students, um, terms and conditions applied by universities, and the speed and effectiveness of complaints. And the CMA um, sort of took this work forward and they've kind of looked at uh, sort of protecting this stuff under consumer law. So it's, um, you know, there, there, are, there are concerns that, that, you know, the sector's not necessarily dealing with this in the, way that, the best way they could. So regulation, it's a sexy topic. No, it's, it's exciting stuff, it, but it's really, really key and fundamental to, to what we do now, I think. Um, I won't go through all of these, but you can see there's a real broad range of, of sort of different types of consumer protection out there. Um, we've got things like, I'll, I have to read these off because I'll get them wrong otherwise, but um, CPRs, invitations to purchase, um, the material information about the goods or services, and you have to be very careful about advertising goods that don't exist, emitting material information that's needed on a decision, aggressive sales tactics, not follow following a commitment of code of practice, um, CCRs are about the contract itself, so the price of the contract, this whole idea of rights cancel. Um, you know, this is really proper consumer stuff now, and this all applies to higher education. Um, UT CCRs, the, the requirements of fairness in contract terms, um, you know, sort of no imbalance on parties' rights. Um, and you know, it's very key, important stuff. And the Competition and Markets Authority, CMA, that I mentioned earlier, um, they formed as a way to take forward some of this stuff. Um, uh, they they um, took on the functions of the Office for Fair Trading and the Competition Commission. And they're, they're really looking at this area and making sure that sort of higher education are doing the right things in this space. Um, so the Consumer Rights Act came into force in 2015 pulling together all these different bits of legislation. And I think the key thing here for us to take is that it's about pre-enrolment and po post-enrolment. So there's two different areas that we're looking at. There's the information or the things that you say to someone before they've actually you know, decided to study at your institution. Um, and this here, we, you know, the stuff that Piero's touched on around personalization, targeting the right people, having those right conversations. But then there's the stuff that happens post-enrolment when you have that contract in place. Um, so this stuff covers the whole of a student's academic career um, and it's really, really key that they get the right information. So the information has to be accurate, complete and clear and made available in a variety of ways. Um, and the onus is on you guys to make sure that this happens. Um, the CMA guidance that came out um, is there to support the sector. Um, they found that the majority of students um, use the website to make those choices, unsurprisingly. I mean, I've seen various other statistics banded around, but basically, they're using your websites to make this very, very big, huge decision, and you need to make sure that you're, you're doing something about it. Just out of interest, how many institutions have got some sort of group that's looking at CMA guidance and dealing with it in some way? So you guys are on this, so I could be, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here. I suppose... The fact that you've got a group and that you're, you're doing some work in this area, whether you've actually cracked the nut, that, that's a, a different matter altogether. And having been to a really interesting session yesterday on digital governance, it's a very complicated space with a, with a lot of work that, to be carried out. Okay, so CMA guidance um, is around information provision. We've mentioned these different stages 
um, the research and application stage, the offer stage, the acceptance stage, and the enrolment stage, and then the terms and conditions that are related to that. And also complaint handling that I've kind of mentioned already. So these are the sort of key things. Um, and the contractual uh, arrangements that are made are, are really kind of very much based on this consumer idea with these 14 days right to cancel and this clear contract that goes on. So what information exactly are we talking about? And I'm sure you all think, oh, we've got all this on our website in, in some way or other. But um, have you? Have you got it in a clear and accurate way? Um, things around entry requirements, you know, what, what a student needs to get in, the tariff that's set, very clarity on that. The mod modules that are involved in that course, um, those modules, you know, they, they need, they're the things that people sign up to. Um, a little discussion I had earlier with Kevin was around, um, you know, say you sign up to a course because it, you've got, it, there's some celebrity that's going to be a lecturer on that course. I think we could talk about Brian Cox or something, and you, you're signing up for that. Is that person going to continue through that course? You know, that's what you, what is in the core module is, is the key stuff there. The contact hours on that course, and I think clarity around what contact hours actually means in, 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 in sort of relation to that course. Expected workload very hard stuff to assess, the qualifications of the staff who will be teaching on that course and how things will be assessed on the course, um, course award, location length, accreditation, and fees. I think fees is really the key one here. And I know that yesterday, I think it was Rob who was talking in the morning, talked about someone in their form formidable PDF of, of fees and you know this big, huge chunk of information about course fees, but this is the kind of stuff that actually they are expecting you to, to have there in some shape or other. Um, just a little aside on course changes, I think this is a really interesting area. The way people design courses is, is very much changing based on the CMA guidance um, because you really need to nail down what's in a course and stick to it. I think there's a much longer cycle now for planning courses. Um, people, it's in a way, it's less reactive and you, it, it, maybe it's stifling innovation a little bit because people can't just come up with something. But you have to be very, very clear in what's going to be involved um, you know, in a particular course and making sure that you have clear deadlines for changes and what, what, um, what sort of means a substantial change and what means a small change. Um, apparently, a witch survey in 2014 f um, found that 58% of students reported a significant change to their course. Um, what does significant mean? Does it mean dropping a module? Does it mean changing lecturers? Does it mean changing the title of the course? Okay. Um, yeah, so 35% found this change wasn't fair. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, this is a really key area, I think. Um, um, so CMA um, have said that they will undertake a review of the sector. I don't personally, I can't find any details on exactly what's going to happen there. Um, but this is something that will be happening at some point or other. They are, have led a big campaign, get, sort of aimed at students, getting students to, to know about this stuff and also encouraging them to submit evidence of non-compliance. So you can see here from some of the posters, they're talking about changes, they're talking about hidden fees. For example, did you know that you were going to have to pay to, go, to take a year out and do X, Y, Z? That's one thing that comes up lots and lots of times, students not knowing about those type of things. Have you got the right information you, you need? Have any of the fees changed? You know, how does IP fit into all of this? So um, this is what the CMA are doing. Um, as you mentioned, people are looking, looking into this area. It's quite hard, actually, to find um, sort of guidance or, or sort of examples of what people are doing in this space. This is a UEA CMA action plan, and they, you know, they've highlighted this, and they've got a working group looking at this area, but people aren't being very open about the kind of activity they're doing in this space. Um, but it, this is a, it's an ongoing thing that involves digital governance and lots of different, lots of different areas, so it, it's quite fundamental. So I suppose the question is, you, you're all nodding and you're all saying, yeah, we, we're doing all this already and you, you, know, you think it's, you've got it covered, but, but have you really got this stuff covered? Um, there's quite a lot of stuff actually in the media about how you guys haven't really got it covered. And I mean, some of this may be from a while back. Um, I'm sure quite a few of you would have had a good look at that witch report there. Um, but there's some real bad press out there about how universities are failing to do this stuff. Um, the universities are breaching consumer law. Um, we're not giving the right information to people. Um, 
The Witch Report, which is, makes interesting reading, it's quite scathing on some of the stuff that appears on websites. Um, they, looked at lo they looked mainly at psychology degree courses, and that was their specific thing that they covered, and it came out in September last year. Um, 12 different areas, including all the stuff that's mentioned in the CMA guidance, and they found that nearly two-thirds fa failed to provide updated information on tu tuition fees. Um, uh, some, some really, really failed. Three providers provided approximately 30% of the information required. Um, they found things like no uniform best practice, that only one in four meeting the minimum um, CMA guidance, 257 pieces of unlawful or in inaccurate information. Um, the, they actually name and shame as well. I'm sure people have gone and seen this stuff. They found things like lack of context for KISS widgets and where things were placed on the website. Just huge amounts of missing information and lack of explanation. So we go back to this thing about contact hours. People just weren't explaining what they meant by contact hours there. Um, so quite, quite worrying stuff. And I'm sure people have started to react to this. Let's hope so. Um, and within our review findings, we're finding that, that um, you know, universities are, are doing these, what they're supposed to be doing, but there's still quite a lot of recommendations there. Um, people just aren't having a coordinated approach to this. They're not being clear about some of the information that's being provided. Um, the recent white paper is really, really focused on fees and says that you know, this, is, this is core and um, if people don't provide this, I think that people are going to... At some point, we will start to see people people being sued in some way, I'm sure. Um, so what's the challenges for you guys? Um, there's, there's lots of things out there that you could be doing. So web governance, digital governance, this type of area is really where you need a very strategic approach to, to what's happening. Um, you need support from the top level up to make sure that you, you've got people um, recognizing that clear processes need to be in place, that, that change needs to be managed clear deadlines and understanding how that change process is carried out. Um, I think one area that's quite interesting is the whole management of social media and clarity about the difference between things like individual accounts and, um, and institutional ones and what things are saying. If you've got a student misinterpreting something that's said on a personal account, that needs to, you need to be clear about what that account is. You know, oh, so-and-so lecturer tweeted this and I saw it and now I didn't, that didn't happen on my course. This is all um, really important stuff. And there was a quote which somebody mentioned from, from last year. I didn't come last year, but some, I, there was a, um, someone gave a presentation and they said something about not wasting, don't waste a good crisis. I think, you know, the thing about this stuff is this is an opportunity for you guys to get your, it's a real driver to get your top level people to start allowing you to have more clarity around these, these processes and making sure that, um, you know, you get the support to make, to to have the right stuff on your websites. So, just some stuff for you to think about. You know, have you got the right information there? Has, is it all clear? Is it accurate? Do you have a change process in place for removing it? Um, are you giving things like additional costs, which is one of the ones that comes up a lot? Um, are you infor informing people about your changes to your courses? How do you inform people? What's a minor change? What's a, what's a sort of major change? What are you doing with your KISS widgets? Um, are they contextualized? Are they in the right place? I think there's some rule about breaking content before the widget. You know, is, is this, are you, you know, making sure that it's, it's not you that, that's gonna be the, pers the, the group that causes someone to basically to uh, sue your institution? Um, just a little bit about how we can help, just to finish up now. Um, we, I mentioned the quality code. We, there's a lot of information there about sort of how we deal with information. We're, we're um, sort of information agnostic, so this applies to everything. We don't just deal with digital. Um, we're, we're sort of interested in all different bits of information, but there's some good stuff within the quality code that you can have a look at how um, you might, you might want to do this in your own, own way. So we, we talk about things like, you know, prospectuses and, and uh, open days and all that, that sort of thing. But part C is a, a part that we do judge institutions on. Um, we give lots of principles, you know, how, how, what sort of information it should be, timely, current, um, that you are responsible for it. I won't spend too much time. Um, and it's got to be reliable and fair and accurate reflection of the opportunities provided. We also have a real range of guidance documents. Um, so some of these are 
are about how you, as an institution, can explain areas. So it's explaining staff teaching qualifications, explaining what class size means, um, explaining what workload means. I mean, the classic thing about the contact hours and students saying, I don't get enough contact hours, but they're on a humanities course that involves reading books, you know, and you don't really want someone sat next to you while you're reading a book all day. So it's just, and also that's really key as well, especially with an international audience, because there are different expectations in different countries about what, um, you know, a workload or contact hours are, and, and just kind of making sure that that's clear when, you, when you're talking to students. And we give guidance on things like responding to feedback from students as well. Um, just to hammer home about this point, um, it's up to you, you're responsible for ensuring that you comply with um, all the regulation and um, consumer protection legislation out there. We haven't seen what's going to happen so far, but there are going to be the fines, there are going to be complaints and loss of reputation, which is, is really key, I think. Um, and uh, my, my presentation's on SlideShare, but I've got a list there of different um, resources that you can have a look at, including some scenarios as well that people have worked through, different cases and how they deal with those. Um, and yeah, basically go away and do good things on your websites and don't let your students get cross with you. So. Yeah.